Good evening. My name is Tim Neff and I'm the Vice President and Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum located here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if, uh, to our regular viewers, you might notice I have somebody a little different with me here by my side. This is our guest today, Bob Pursuti, and I'll give him an opportunity to kind of tell you a little bit about himself as we move along here. Um, but we are focusing tonight on Dollar Bank, which is a local bank here in Pittsburgh. And um, when we ta started talking about this, it was interesting to, to get involved with Dollar Bank, um, but we weren't quite sure if what connections there would be. And uh, sure enough, we found some very interesting ones, which we'll be highlighting throughout our program this evening. This is our Spotlight On program, which takes place the second Thursday of each month. And uh, we thank you all for joining us this evening. I will also just take a moment to point out, we just had a little internet issue. It seems like this is becoming regular. This happened last month as well, but luckily it didn't affect the program last month and hopefully it doesn't today. But if for some reason we get cut off, um, please bear with us. It just took a minute to reboot and come right back. So I uh, just wanna point that out and uh, you know, let everybody know that uh, the internet is, is giving us a little hassle, but hopefully it won't be an issue tonight. Um, but like I said, this is our Spotlight On program. Thank you to all for spending your, your time with us this evening. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slideshow here so that we can take a look. As I said, we'll be highlighting Dollar Bank. But before we start, as always, I like to talk a little bit about Soldiers and Sailors, just so you know, uh, some of you might be tuning in for the first time. That is our building there located in the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh, right on the campus of the University of Pittsburgh. And Soldiers and Sailors was built back in 1910 as a memorial to the 25,000 men from Allegheny County that fought in the Civil War. Uh, now keep that in the back of your minds there about being built, because that's one of the close ties that we have to Dollar Bank, which we'll be discussing in a little bit. Um, but even though it was built as a Civil War memorial, today it's a memorial that stands to honor all those that serve our, served our country from the Civil War through present day. And uh, we have exhibits filled with artifacts in our hallways that you can see in the photo there on the right that tell personal stories about these individuals and their service to our, to our country. And that's what Soldiers and Sailors is all about. So if you haven't been here in a while, we always encourage you to come down and visit us. And I'll talk a little bit about that and of some of our upcoming events at the end of the program here. As always, we have question and answer available. Uh, we love questions. If you have a question on Facebook, all you have to do is submit a comment. And if you are uh, on, on the comment section, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can email us at soldiersandsailorspittsburgh at gmail.com. And we'll do our best to answer either live if we get to it, or if you email us, we may also uh, have to reply via email later on. But either way, you're gonna get an answer one way or the other. So please keep questions in mind and be, uh, be uh, ready to, to share those with us at the end of the program. As I said, my name is Tim Neff, um, and uh, I've been working here at Soldiers and Sailors since 2002. And it's been a real honor to work here. And with me tonight is Bob Pursuti, and I'll let Bob tell us a little bit about him. Okay. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Robert Pursuti. I work as the archivist for Dollar Bank here in Pittsburgh. I've um, been with the bank since 2014, and my job is generally to work and preserve and research uh, the materials of historic importance to the bank and also to reach out and make connections on behalf of the bank to other organizations around the city. Um, so I guess we could start. Let me ask you before oh, we sorry. start, um, you, you said make connections. So obviously yeah. making this connection was great. Is it common for a bank to have an archivist? I, I, I'm just curious, is that something that most banks have? Uh, uh, I would say depending on the size, uh, there are a number of banks that have archivists, uh, especially the larger corporate banks. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, in those contexts, the archivist uh, in the role would be mainly more interested in focused on doing sort of records and information management. Uh, what's really unique about the way Dollar Bank operates is that since we have no shareholders and the depositors are our uh, owners of our bank, we have a lot more latitude to do interesting historical projects, whereas other banks might be only interested in quarter to quarter profits. Right, right. And of course, the age of this bank, which we'll find learn yeah. a little bit more about, plays into some of the, the massive amounts of records that, that you have here. And um, just like to point out that we are on the campus of the University of Pittsburgh, and we are two graduates sitting here. We found that out and sharing some stories. We weren't at school at the same time, but sharing some of our experiences uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. All right, so let's bring up our slideshow again here. And uh, I think we're ready for your first slide here uh, to introduce Dollar Bank. Sure, sure. So um, 
just to start off, the uh, the presentation that we want to provide tonight is exploring some of the uh, intersections between the history of the Sword and Sales Memorial serving uh, both veterans and people that served in the military and uh, are amongst our depositors at Dollar Bank. So um, the photo that you're seeing here is a really interesting photo. It's it's actually the photo of our first headquarters, of which is still located on the 4th Avenue Street in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, this is the um, building as it was initially. Um, now there are two wings that were put on uh, for expansion of office space. But um, this is, well, in the 1880s, as the caption says, um, initially the two plots on either side were just grass and uh, the bank used to, to kind of, in the early days, to generate some extra revenue, uh, grow vegetables and then sell those vegetables down at Market Square, which was then the Market House uh, downtown. So um, if you are ever on 4th Avenue, we have a little museum in the back, I'm kind of exploring the history of the bank and the development of the city. And so uh, I'd invite you to uh, go there and it's open anytime during regular business hours. Wonderful, and I have been there myself and it is a, a very interesting little glimpse into the, the building's history and the history of Dollar Bank. Uh, and I just love this photo because it just looks like it's so isolated. If you're down there now, you cannot imagine Fourth Avenue without, you know, buildings everywhere and all built up. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I love the story about the vegetables. I had not heard that before. So I don't think many banks are, are supplementing their profits with selling vegetables anymore. Well, I mean, you have to start somewhere. And yeah, exactly. It speaks to the, you know, how, uh, how we started and um, what we've grown into. Literally grassroots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, to start off, I'll, I'll go over a little bit of general information about Dollar Bank. Uh, Dollar Bank is the oldest bank in the city of Pittsburgh. There was some disagreement about that in the papers in the 2000s, but actually um, another bank in the city claimed that through residual purchases that they were the oldest bank, but that was not true. The bank, uh, Dollar Bank, has been open since 1855 continuously. It has never shut its doors, even during times of great economic crisis. Um, so during bank runs, we never shut our doors, uh, and we were always able to grow and maintain uh, a very conservative and uh, balanced situation with our finances. So uh, point of pride. Um, the dollar bank was the first mutual savings bank in Pittsburgh. Um, I, again, uh, I kind of touched on this before, but a mutual savings bank is a bit different. It's, it's a bit unusual for this area. Um, it mainly those type of banks are from the, the New England area. Um, a mutual bank is to be best described as sort of between a credit union and a commercial bank. Um, the idea is that a mutual bank has a mutual obligation that uh, between it benefiting itself and also benefiting the communities in which it operates. And so that's explicitly written into the designation and in our charter. Um, you see a photo here of our founder, Charles Colton. He was a migrant from uh, New England who made his fortune initially in um, mutual um, insurance, and he came to Pittsburgh. And he had a vision for um, the bank uh, that would uh, kind of be a lot different, which I'll explain next. Um, the name of Dollar Bank, actually we had three names in our, in our history. Initially, we were the Pittsburgh Dollar Savings Institution. Later, that changed uh, to Dollar Savings Bank, which was for a long time until 1984 when we expanded and then be, we chose the name Dollar Bank, which was also reflected the, the, the growing size of the bank, but also what the services we offered. Yeah, I, I noticed, I think, uh, yeah, this is, this is where the, the, the origins of that name come from, which I think yeah. is very, very fascinating. So Dollar Bank, the, 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 the name of the bank was not just chosen at random. Uh, it was actually known uh, that the goal of the bank was that you only needed a dollar to become an account holder. And this was very unique for uh, banks at the time, because usually if you had a bank account, banks would want you to have a sizable amount of assets to make it worth their while to do business with you. Well, when Charles Colton, our founder, came from New, uh, New England, he was both uh, a savvy businessman and he was also uh, a bit of a religious man. He thought, well, why can't I make a bank for all of the what was termed the unbanked population 
mostly tradesmen and working class people in Pittsburgh. And I won't charge them, you know, a lot of money to open accounts. I, I will use uh, the power of crowdsourcing essentially to open a bank with just one dollar at a time. And um, in our charter, again, it's it's explicitly a bank for working class people and tradespeople. And I think that's probably leads us to some of the connections we are able to make here because you know, that's usually the folks who are entering the military and yeah. serving their country and serving in these different times of war. And that's kind of what we're going to be highlighting as we go through the program here are some of the the, the veterans that, that banked with you. Um, and I think that comes from from this or this humble origins. Yes, of definitely. The working class side. Um, I'm very fortunate in that I get to one of my main uh, roles at the bank is to work on expanding the dollar bank historical collection. Otherwise, we call the corporate archives. And this corpus of material are records, uh, administrative records, photographs, different ledger books that run from 1855, the very beginning of the bank, to uh, 2022. So as far as the historical element, uh, generally, we research things starting in 1855 to 1920. Um, some of the records are restricted because of financial reasons. But um, when we speak of the historical section, it's generally 1855 to 1920. And some of the records that are included in that area are original customer records, often referred to as signature books, which an example is on the side of the frame here. Um, and these were handwritten um, accounts that people came into the bank before computers and they put down their signature to open an account, hence the name signature books. Um, they're, they're really interesting uh, ledgers. We have hundreds of them. And what they actually came to be are they're, they're a handwritten database of information of individuals in Pittsburgh that may not have been documented anywhere else. So you may have someone who uh, immigrated from some Euro a European country, maybe Denmark, uh, came and was a, a baker uh, and lived in a certain area. All this information is in the signature books. So it's really a great resource. Uh, for us to do both individual research on on people and also thematic research and cultural research on more general um, ideas. So it just came to mind here when they entered their information, what, did they enter it themselves? And so is there uh, all different handwriting through these books or was yeah. there a, a, somebody that actually did it for them? That's an interesting, uh, it's a very <laughs> astute question to bring up because um, usually if the person was uh, able to write their name, they would write it in. Um, oftentimes, though, for different reasons, people were unable to write their sure. name. If they had one, if they had an injury, uh, other some people were illiterate, mm -hmm. and they would put an X, and the um, clerk would write their name for them. Mm -hmm. Other um, people were coming from countries where they don't use the standard Latin alphabet, sure. mm -hmm. so they would just uh, have write an X, or or they would phonetically write you right. know, their name through the the clerk. So, yeah, a lot of very interesting makes details. some interesting translations. I'm sure to yeah. try to read through. Um, other another type of record that we have in the historical collection are cash books, and these are really important for for tracing a, a, through um, seeing daily movement of money uh, in and out of the bank. And so, incoming uh, marks might be deposits or loan and mortgage payments, dividends on bank investments, and outgoing uh, might be payments on. Um, investing in stocks and bonds, which we'll talk about later, uh, salaries and operating expenses. So we have an example here. It might be hard to see uh, on your home computer or even your phone if you're looking, but this is ex a general example of a cash book page. Uh, this one is from 1883, and we have an entry uh, of taxes being paid to the city of Pittsburgh, which <laughs> is, is true in every era, uh, $3,400, and also real estate taxes. Uh, for seven thousand dollars, I'm sure those have gone up significantly since, since yeah. then. But that's a significant. I mean, that has to be some significant property that they're talking about there. Yeah. Well, mainly, um, most of that was probably from the Fourth Avenue branch. Yeah. That we had. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now we're to the the real connection here yeah. that really sparked uh, a lot of this this program here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what really excited us uh, when we first started talking and was that we rediscovered that Dollar Bank actually uh, provided the majority of the funding through loans for the building of Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall. These loans were bonds specifically that were issued through Allegheny County. 
Um, the and and Tim can speak definitely a, a great length compared to me. But from what I understand, the the building was proposed or some sort of structure was proposed in 1891. Right. And right. Um, later in um, that that was at a meeting of the Grand Army of the Republic. Correct. Yeah, the yeah. local posts. There was 28 uh, posts in Allegheny County that formed kind of a. Uh, conglomerate of Grand Army posts, and, and yeah. yes, you're exactly right. 1891 was that initial thought mm -hmm. of we need something to yeah. memorialize our compadres that served in the Civil War. Yeah. And and I think it was interesting. Uh, uh, beyond that, later um, there was a discussion that instead of just a, a, a more a monument to make it a memorial hall for you know active uh, events and things mm -hmm. like that, and, and then by 1907. Uh, in 1908, that's when the bonds were issued right. and people began to, to purchase them. Yeah, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort yep. for this this uh, group of GAR posts to pass some legislation that needed to be passed to access uh, public funding. Um, they knew that this could not be funded by private uh, investors, so there had to be a different way to do it. And uh, some of that was through these bonds that uh, Robert's talking about here. So you can see that uh, there was these are some of the main bonds um, you see the ones that Dollar Bank bought in 1907 and 1908. There was also two companies on the East Coast, one in New York City and one in Philadelphia that also provided money. Uh, what's of uh, note for us is that we provided around $700,000 uh, in funding and that it represented about 55% of the entire funding to make this all possible. So majority, we can call yeah. it the majority of the, the bonds were purchased through Dollar Bank um for this and i i just wanted to note I, I had a quote here you know when you're talking about soldiers and sailors and the origins of it one of the goals this is one of the early goals they, they had in, in quoted here it says goal to create a memorial of character so imposing and impressive as to represent the wealth intelligence and patriotic sentiment of our great industrial center i think that quote is is so meaningful because uh, when you know soldiers and sailors and you've been here before, they, they accomplished that. Uh, it took probably a lot longer than they wanted it to take and cost probably a lot more than they wanted it to cost. Um, uh, but uh, I think it, they, they said that we're talking about $1.25 million or so it cost to build this uh, uh, in, in 1910. So, you know, 1908 to 1910 was the construction of the building. So you can imagine that's a lot of money today. In 1910, that was very significant. But it spoke, I always, when I'm talking about this, I think it just speaks to how important it was to this region to recognize these Civil War veterans, these, these veterans of the, of the Union Army to make sure that their memory was preserved, which is still a big part of our mission even today. Uh, yes, we've expanded it to other wars, but the, the, the essence is still there with the idea of honoring and remembering those that have served our country. Okay. Hey, um... I want to just take a moment uh, to give an example of one of these individuals that we find in our signature books um, that we can do just research on. Um, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people that have interesting backstories. Um, this gentleman here, uh, J.W. Frank Kafka, was uh, in the U.S. Navy. He opened up his account with Dollar Bank in November of 1896. And initially he was aboard the USS Columbia. Um, a few years later, uh, the Spanish-American War started. Actually, I think it was less than a year. <laughs> it may, may have been several months. 1898 would have been the, oh. yeah. Yeah, he, he, uh, the Spanish-American War began and he was assigned to the USS Topeka hmm. as a mechanic. And so again, this is just a gentleman who had opened an account with us of hundreds of thousands of people. And um, I think it really speaks to um, your quote um, about how these people were essentially people working in an industrial area and then they became soldiers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting. And those folks were looking for an affordable way, place to do their banking and they, they found, in, found yes. it at Dollar Bank. Okay, um, for the second half of the presentation, we're gonna have um, four individuals that have especially interesting stories that were all depositors at Dollar Bank. Um, to start with, um, we want to highlight this gentleman, Charles F. McKenna. Um, he was, uh, for the majority of his career, an attorney. He later became a judge. And he actually um, opened his account in February of 1874. 
uh, which was after the Civil War, but he had actually served um, in the uh, Company E of the 155th Regiment of Pennsylvania at 17 in 1862. And, and three works, weeks after he joined, um, he saw the Battle of Antietam, which was uh, quite a big battle during the Civil costliest War. Costliest one-day battle. Of yes. Yep. I said big. I, I should have said the costliest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, it would have fit the banking yeah. all, all through and through. Yeah, so um, again, uh, interesting going from being a 17-year-old to one of the you know the biggest battle in U.S. history. Um, he, uh, if you want to move ahead. Yep. Yeah, we, we were able to find some some contextual information from uh, the university, or excuse me, Virginia Tech University, in which um, there were some notes that he actually had taken part in a, in a very wide variety of different battles. Um, you can see from the insert uh, image in Tetum, Fredericksburg, um, Appomattox, uh, all these big battles uh, that I think that even to uh, um, school children uh, who learn about the Civil War know. So he was definitely saw a lot of action. Um, during the course of, his, of the war that he was in his uh, 155th Regiment, um, 134 men were killed in combat, 350 were wounded, and 167 in his regiment died from disease, which is, uh, I think, is always interesting uh, perspective when you look at the Civil War, that the same or more numbers of people died from disease mm -hmm. uh, than actual combat. Yeah, it was a bigger threat than combat was the spread of disease. Yep, you're exactly right. Yes, and um, he actually was very active in his regiment uh, association after he uh, retired. Um, he wrote a first person history of his regiment's battles and also provide, he provided sketches and, and everything um, in this book called Under the Maltese Cross. This uh, book actually is in the library for the University of Pittsburgh. Um, he, um, it, it's, I, I think it's probably in the special collections, but you could probably go and take a look at it. Um, and generally, um, he, he stayed, uh, as a secretary of his regimental organization for the rest of his life. And, um, that's kind of like his story. Yeah. He, uh, uh we have this book as well in our collection. Um, the, uh, the Maltese cross symbol is very significant to soldiers and sailors. It is embedded in our front walk uh, front hall. As soon as you enter the building, you see it um, representing the fifth core of the Civil War, which uh, had clearly a lot of Allegheny County Pittsburgh presence in it because they used the Maltese cross throughout the building in some of the decorative pieces. So um, that that's one tie here. But Charles McKenna has many more ties to soldiers and sailors. So this is uh, a picture of our founder's plaque, which is also located in our front hall with these raised relief uh, images of in bronze of some of our founding um, uh, fathers, if you will, people that served on the, the Civil War Veterans Committee and Charles McKenna was one of them. So that is him appearing on um, the plaque in our front hallway. Um, like I said, these were a part of this committee that uh, was of the Grand, the Ar Grand Army Republic Forum. This, it was called the Committee of 10, but I, I, from what I can tell, more than that actually ended up serving some people passed away because so much time elapsed. You know, there were people who were there in 1891 that really wanted to see this come to fruition that never actually got to see it because they passed away in the in the interim years. Um, but Charles McKenna does appear in our front hallway that way. We also are very fortunate to have a scrapbook that um, would belong to Charles McKenna that he kept some of his, his little articles and things in. Uh, it's a you know very detailed kind of uh, encapsulation of what he experienced. We also have some of his letters uh, that talk about, you know, some of the things you went through. He, he talked about how he was only 17 years old and then 18, and he, he really lamented the fact that, you know, that he was a soldier and he couldn't vote. I just caught that little tidbit in one of his letters. He was complaining about not having the ability to vote. Um, and uh, also a little nugget of information, which is pictured here is that center photograph is uh, a note from General McClellan who was corresponding with McKenna after the war. And they were specifically corresponding with the photograph to the right, which is a very famous photograph, Abraham Lincoln visiting the troops. Uh, you can see him towering over, we were commenting how tall he was and towering over the other individuals in that photograph. And that little handwritten note from McClellan is a real key to understanding that photo. 
And uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave a little teaser. Uh, you know, sometimes I like to do this because next month our Spotlight On program will be about scrapbooks in our collection. We have such a great collection of scrapbooks from different eras. And I thought, you know, we really talked about it and, you know, what better way will be around Veterans Day. And this is a way that many veterans and their families preserve their history, um, you know, uh, keep their history alive and, and pass it from one generation to the next through scrapbooks like this. So next month, you'll have to tune in to learn all about the scrapbooks in our collection here at Soldiers and Sailors. And we'll give you the final piece to this puzzle um, about this interesting, famous photograph and, and what was discovered in McKenna's scrapbook. So another tie uh, to Soldiers and Sailors here. And also one last one is we have a beautiful image of McKenna and Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Uh, to you Civil War buffs out there, I know that name rings a bell. Um, he was, of course, uh, the 20th Maine at Little Round Top at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, he was uh, a hero of that battle and, and went on to, to great fame after the war. Uh, and that is him and McKenna visiting Gettysburg as part of, I'm sure, of a reunion. And uh, they're standing by the Pennsylvania Monument, which is, uh, of course, one of the larger monuments at Gettysburg that lists all the men from Pennsylvania that, that served in the war, including McKenna. His name would have appeared on there. And this is actually an unpublished photo. It's in our, it's on display here at the museum, but it has never been published in a book or anywhere like that, anywhere else. So uh, we're very honored to have this little little piece of history and another great connection through Charles McKenna with with Dollar Bank here. Thanks. Um, so Daniel W. Downing, a very interesting fellow. Um, he actually was one of the in 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 Pittsburgh, one of the early. Uh, African American police officers. He, uh, before he came back to Pittsburgh and became a police officer, he actually served as a Buffalo soldier on the American frontier wars. Um, this was during the resettlement campaign for Native Americans uh, that involved skirmishes of the Native Americans, both with the United States Army and the Mexican Army, um, as the two countries were spreading. Um, if we can go to the yep. next slide. Um, he was in the 9th Cavalry and the he served for several years. Um, and the battle or, or the campaign that was uh, of highest note that he was involved in was the campaign uh, versus a Chief Victorio who was an Apache leader. Um, this gentleman was against the relocation of his tribe and um, had a a uh, battle, uh, an army of uh, about 300 Apache warriors against both the U.S. and the Mexicans um, at the time. And eventually uh, he was defeated, but um, it was uh, quite a, a serious battle. Um, so this gentleman, Downing, uh, was on the frontier, came back to the east, um, became a police officer. Um, very interesting fellow. He was actually part of the Odd Fellows social organization, fraternal organization that existed. Um, you could see his lodge uh, in there. I'm not sure, but it, were, were the Odd Fellows um, specifically gathered from policemen? Or is that Very well could be. Okay. I, I can't speak to that 100%, but I, yeah. I, that does kind of ring a bell. Yeah, I, I find it interesting that, um, it, it, that his um, group photo here is... is um, it is, uh, it, it's a photo uh, where the lodge seems to be mixed racially, which I think was probably pretty uncommon at the time. Yeah, I would imagine um, so. Yeah. It, it, so it may very well have been derived from the police officer mm -hmm. uh, corps. And um, I don't know, the baton kind of stuck out to me. Is that, mm -hmm. you know, a sign of, a sign of uh, right. relation to police? But again, a very interesting fellow, um, important to recognize. Yeah, no, uh, although we don't have any ties to him, uh, we do have um, a Medal of Honor in our collection uh, from the same time period. Uh, it's not one of the ones directly behind us here. As many of you know, we usually use our Medals of Honor as a backdrop, but in this room, uh, back off to my right, there are uh, some other medals and one is included of this same time period. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, a woman named Edith Hartzell Grandy, um, she, actually opened her account with Dollar Bank in March of 1898. And in the next month of April of 1898, the Spanish Civil or the, the Spanish-American War started and she joined a 
group of women, about 1,500 that were nurses in the army that were sent to either um, uh, forts or, um, well, camps really, uh, camps for injured soldiers that were present in Florida. And some of them were actually also sent on to hospital ships in the Caribbean. Um, she actually was um, sent to uh, Camp Cuba Libre in Jacksonville, Florida. And this is a very interesting story. This camp in Florida was well known for being uh, very, very uh, disgusting. Uh, there was very small amount of sanitation. And actually it was um, this camp that um, many people know the name Walter Reed uh, as uh, the name of the gentleman, the uh, one of the VA hospitals is named after. He actually worked with the nurses, including Miss Grandy, to begin to better appropriately uh, take care of sanitation in these uh, injury camps. And so uh, a very interesting section of um, mainstream, I guess, U.S. history and, and history of women that you may not have known. Um, so she served uh, between 1898 uh, in September and December in 1898. Uh, later, had a good life. She, she came back uh, after the war, married a uh, person uh, from Iowa. Uh, in, then they moved to California. And she still has some family that has connections to Pittsburgh, but um, lived out the majority of her life out in California. And this might be a good time. Uh, I'm just curious. I know we saw those ledger books, um, but it's not like these people are recording that they were a veteran or a nurse or anything like that. So this is really um, putting in some legwork on your end, right, to, to dig into these individuals. So you have a name, you might have an occupation, like you mentioned, and an address like that, but you're really doing that extra step to find all this other information about these individuals. Yeah, the, um, um, well, first I'd like to say that uh, a, a, a large amount of this work is done by my colleague, Dorothy Spangler, who uh, couldn't be here tonight, but um, so I want to make sure to recognize her. The occupation, unless they were sort of a career army person or military person. Right, they, they wouldn't show up there. Yeah, it would just be like they're a baker that, mm -hmm. that they joined the army. So yeah, it, it does take some work uh, to, to search that. Again, Dorothy Spangler is a very very great asset. Yeah, I thought you might want to get her name out there. Just, yeah. So this is uh, World War One here, Raymond Cronin. Yeah. So this will be the uh, final person we take a look at tonight. Uh, very uh, storied individual. Um, Mr. Cronin was, uh, he actually served in the Marines for four years when he was uh, young. He got out and then became a post office deliverer uh, or a postman. Um, and then soon after, uh, he opened his account in September 1916 at Dollar Bank. Um, and uh, just the next year, uh, he went to World War I, joined back the Marines, worked his way up in the ranks, and uh, was actually um, stationed on the front in France. Um, very uh, courageous individual. He was... Uh, killed at the Battle of Belleau Wood, um, and he was actually awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his actions during that battle. Um, he, the, you can see the description on the slide there, but essentially it was his remaining group, uh, and then there was a French uh, line that was, in, and in between there was some uh, German soldiers that were kind of um, flanking and splitting the line. So he tried to to seal that up and he was unfortunately killed in action. But um, I think that uh, certainly very courageous individual. Yeah, I think um, just take a take a quick note here. Um, Bella Wood, uh, that battle, it might be familiar to some some of those World War One buffs out there. That was that first kind of action for the Marines where they they earned their nickname, the Devil Dogs, because they fought so hard. There was certainly a lot of, um, you know, uh, other armies that when the U.S. got over there, they thought, oh, these guys aren't going to be tough. They're not going to be able to get the job done. You know, they're, they're new to this war. And this was a very big proving ground for the Marine Corps uh, in, in that war and, and specifically where they got the name Devil Dogs. 
And also speaking to the Distinguished Cross there, we were talking, that is the second highest medal um, that can be awarded in our military. Medal of Honor being the highest, and then right below that is the Distinguished Cross. And World War I was the first war that they were issued. And um, Soldiers and Sailors, of course, has a Hall of Valor program. Uh, now, the Hall of Valor was established back in the 1950s here at Soldiers and Sailors. Right now, um, we are actually sitting in the, the Hall of Valor room and it honors soldiers who have received the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Cross, and the Silver Star. And if you're from Pennsylvania and you've received one of these medals, you're eligible to be inducted into the Hall of Valor. And we have over 700 uh, inductees. And it's one of the best, best programs we have here. It's kind of the last stop on the tour because it's local heroes. It, it's highlighting these individuals that went above and beyond the call of duty in the face of en and the enemy and did some amazing things and often laid down their lives or, or risked their lives to save somebody else. So it really, I, I think, sums up so much of why Soldiers and Sailors is important to preserving these stories. I say all that to say, unfortunately, Raymond Cronin is not in our Hall of Valor. And um, that is, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. I will say that um, people that are, are, are inducted by, by nomination. So in other words, somebody has to come forward on behalf of an individual to get them inducted into the Hall of Valor. Um, and uh, obviously uh, this has never happened for Raymond Cronin. So uh, and the off chance that there's anybody out there that, that, that might know him or know something about him, that I know this is a one in a million shot, um, you know, it, it's, it's just kind of opened my eyes that, you know, sometimes, I, at least for me, I think, all right, we've got to have almost everybody now, especially in the Allegheny County area. And then there's always somebody like this that pops up that we don't know about. Um, so I, I you know, want to thank Dollar Bank for, if nothing else, just bringing that to our attention, uh, that there are still individuals out there that, that have earned uh, what uh, qualifies for our Hall of Valor here, um, but just for one reason or another have never been, to, been nominated to, to be inducted in. Okay, yeah, and to just finish with Mr. Cronin, um, this is an image. His sister, after he was killed in action, um, commissioned this uh, plaque um, of him and other post workers in the city that were either served or killed or wounded in um, in World War One, and I think that's a really interesting um, point to to contemplate that when we walk around Pittsburgh, there's a lot of, of these type of plaques in different places, in different neighborhoods. And these are individuals that, you know, we might just feel that, well, this, these were soldiers, quote unquote, from a hundred years ago, but each, each of these people were individuals. And I, I think that, um, you know, the mission of the sailors, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial, as well as, you know, the goal of Dollar Bank being a mutual institution, I think that, um, you know, to focus on their individual stories is something that, you know, as we work at the bank, we're Pittsburghers too, that it's a very, um, it's a very, you know, honorable and, and something that's, that's very close to our hearts as well. So, you know, again, uh, we work for these organizations, but we're Pittsburghers too, and we want to make sure that these stories are told. Yeah. And uh, we're so thankful to be able to give a little avenue to get some of these stories out there that uh, you guys are are putting the effort into uncovering. And, uh, you know, it's just great to be able to share them. I notice here that the post 206 VFW was named after Raymond Cronin. So even more of a, a just a complete surprise to me that he is not in our Hall of Valor. Um, and when you're talking about, you know, remembering and honoring uh, soldiers and sailors was very fortunate um, last year to work with the city of Pittsburgh to get some members of our Hall of Valor recognized on banners, although they're actually steel signs along the Boulevard of the Allies. So if you're ever down on the Boulevard of the Allies and you're you're going for a walk, just like a lot of the towns have the banners up on light posts and electrical poles and things like that. And it's a face and a name. I think, you know, it's not their whole story, but it's very personal yeah. in terms of face and name. And uh, if you're on the uh, Boulevard of the Allies, all those are individuals from our Hall of Valor that uh, are, are lining those streets. Um, so we're very honored to, to be able to supply that information to the city so that those individuals could be remembered in downtown Pittsburgh. 
Yep. Yeah, and that brings us back to the, the shared history in that original photo. I do want to also take a moment at this at this junction just to say, you know, I have visited there before. Um, it's a wonderful uh, building. If you're into old architecture, if you're just into Pittsburgh history, it's worth seeing. Um, I know the, the lions out front are a big source of pride. Uh, you know, they had these beautiful sculpted lions. I don't know, do you want to speak to that at all? I mean, I know that's one of yeah. the highlights when you go to visit there. Yeah, the, the lions uh, sculptures, um, They've been a mainstay uh, in on Fourth Avenue since 1871 when they were carved on site by an immigrant named Max Kohler, uh, an immigrant sculptor. And um, we actually had brought those original ones inside the building and we have exact replicas now outside. So you can see both of them. Um, the older ones were getting just too frail for the Pittsburgh winters, but the, um, the, the lions themselves are the symbol of Dollar Bank and it's meant to uh, be a symbol of protecting people's money. And um, they're just really cool art artifacts as well. So I encourage you to come down and have a look. Yeah, and that's another thing, like when you go down there to visit, you can see the restoration process of the original ones and how much effort was put into to saving those. And then of course you have the, the newer ones outside that you can see as well. And just to be clear, you don't have to pay to go in, right? You can no, no, no. stop in and, and see this stuff anytime during banking hours. So. Um, I don't know about some of you out there, but I love walking around downtown and uh, sometimes you have to wait for like a doors open or something like that program to be able to go into these buildings. But you guys are, are right there, uh, a bank and a building of the people that you can always, always visit. Yes. So, well, uh, I hope that we have some questions. So at this time, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Uh, as I mentioned, you can type them into uh, uh, the comments page here. And um, actually, we have one already coming up here. Are the names in your old deposit records indexed? Easy to find a specific last name in a certain era. So is there indexes to these things or are you all scattered about? Well, unfortunately, they are all scattered about. Mm -hmm. um, so the books themselves, this is the question that, um, you know, most people are interested in. This is the question that I'm most interested in and the bank's most interested in. Uh, the books were signed chronologically as people came into the bank on a specific day to sign up for their uh, new accounts. Um, the, uh, they're, they're not by last name it, and even by year, it's like if you had an ancestor that you knew uh, open an account at Dollar Bank during a year, we still have to go through manually and look at all of the names. So the ultimate goal, not just in the corporate archives for Dollar Bank, but in the world of museums and archives and libraries generally is to soon be able to do optical character recognition on all of these handwritten uh, ledgers and then be able to do a computer search uh, with text. Um, I'm sure most people in the audience know that there are already ways for, um, for typewritten faces to be made into machine readable uh, text, but for uh, late 19th century and early 20th century handwriting. Uh, there hasn't really been something developed yet, but there are projects, uh, one of which is at CMU that's looking to do that, um, which um, the the capture project is, is probably the, the one that people most know when you sign up for an account on a website and it says, pick out all the fire trucks or or pick out the all the letter H's. Um, that's actually one of the applications of that project. So hopefully, within the next five to 10 years or sooner, uh, we'll be able to do machine readable searches of handwritten notes. And then that extra challenge of all the different uh, handwritings in there will come yeah. into play, I'm sure. But that's really interesting. I, I'm a little familiar with that, but I'm glad you brought that up because you know it's a challenge for us uh, trying to digitize our records and get our, um, our archives more accessible to the public, which really well, that's what it's all about, right? Is getting this information accessible to the public. And, and it's such a shame, uh, I won't mention any names of course, but we get interns anymore and we ask them, you know, can you transcribe a letter for us? And they have to tell us they don't know how to read cursive writing. So uh, it's a little, little frustrating at times when you're trying to dig into some of this information and here you have an able-bodied person who could really help you out and they can't really help you because they can't, they can't read cursive. So if there's any other questions, please keep submitting them along the way here. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that question. And uh, thank you for viewing. Uh, I know you're a loyal, a loyal uh, viewer, so thank you. Um, but in the meantime, I will take this moment to, to plug some soldiers and sailors things. 
Um, as, of course, we're open uh, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Um, you can always just walk in and go through the museum, although I always recommend to check our website first, soldiersandsailorshall.org, just to make sure there's not an event or something that could prohibit um, you vi visiting the museum. Um, you can also arrange for a guided tour, uh, which is by appointment only, but can be called ahead and, and schedule a guided tour. Um, as many of you have mentioned or, or maybe remember, we are started a Soldiers and Sailors Tabletop Gamers Club here, and uh, the next gaming day is actually this Saturday, just uh, coming up in a couple days. Uh, so anybody out there interested in tabletop gaming, and more specifically military tabletop gaming, um, please uh, look at our website for more information about that, or just come on down. We play all day long, um, and uh, there's... Um, uh, all ages uh, 10 and up really ages 10 and up are invited to come down and participate in these in these games and i like i like to say it gets away from the screen time gets away from the television time and you know kind of interact with other love it, people who love history it's a, a really great program um and then also coming up at the end of this month we have on october 28th is a special event for us this is our silence of the lambs lambs evening and you're probably wondering why, after all this history, are we talking about Silence of the Lambs? Well, you probably are familiar with the fact that this uh, was filmed here. A lot of the movie was filmed in our building. About 20 minutes or so of the movie were filmed in the building here. Um, and each year we have a special event to kind of commemorate that. And this year on October 28th from 5.30 to 10.30, we will be having all kinds of activities going on in the museum. Uh, the museum will be open, but there'll also be uh, DJ and face painting and pumpkin carving and an exorcist for, yeah, uh, even an exorcist will be here. Um, and there'll be additional things like tarot card readings that you can pay to, to have done. Um, we will have a cage built up in the third floor. That's the scene that it was moved, used for was the cage scene. So you can come see a replica of the cage in, this, in the room that it was filmed in. And that'll all be followed up with a showing of the complete movie in our auditorium uh, beginning at 7.30. So it's a wonderful night. It's a chance to come and visit the museum, but also get to see, you know, piece of movie history and this very famous movie, Silence of the Lambs here. So um, for more information on that, as always, you can visit our website. And finally, I think I just have, as I touched on in the middle of the program here, our next spotlight on will be scrapbooks, preserving history. Um, this is uh, gonna be around Veterans Day. So what better time to talk about preserving stories, preserving those stories of veterans, uh, then, then that time of year. So on November 10th, the day before Veterans Day, uh, we will be uh, talking about scrapbooks in our collection. And then the next day will be Veterans Day, November 11th, uh, which we are open all day for free to the public that day. And we'll have a special program for um, post 9-11 veterans. Um, if, uh, we'll get an opportunity to interact with our America Defender statue. Some of you have watched us know that we did a program about our brand new edition, the America's Defender statue, uh, um, honoring all those in, that fought in the global war on terror. And we're going to have a special uh, program in the, the evening of November 11th for uh, those veterans to come and be recognized and experience the statue firsthand, which you are more than welcome to come and experience anytime. It's on the side of the building on Bigelow uh, Boulevard. Uh, to, to come see. So with that, I am not seeing any other questions come up, uh, but I just wanna say thank you, Robert, for, for joining me this evening. It was, uh, we first met, I think almost six months ago, I think by the, by now, just kind of uh, through some people that uh, kind of brought us together and uh, weren't sure what we could make work, um, but you were kind enough to invite us down and, and go through down there and, and meet Dorothy as well. And then uh, you guys put together some, some interesting stories and we were able to find those connections yeah. so um well on behalf of the bank uh, dollar bank uh, it's been a real honor i think this is the start of a, a great collaboration between our two institutions and uh, i guess we'll uh, have to show uh, what we can come up with next yeah with, with what other gems and, and nuggets of information are out there so with that i want to thank everybody for joining us this evening for our spotlight on program here at soldiers and sailors memorial hall and museum and uh, please tune in next month, as we said, the second Thursday, which will be November 10th, for our next edition of, of Spotlight On. And in the meantime, please visit and uh, everybody take care and have a good night.